Thank you, members. Uh, with that, we'll move to question time. I would have handed it over. Leader Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, FOI documents obtained by the Canberra Liberal, Liberals reveal the government approved an exemption from procurement regulations requiring three written quotes for spending up to $200,000 to award a Darwin-based developer the Choose Canberra contract. Bramium Labs got the job despite a government document revealing it did not have the capacity to provide 24-7 support, which it said, quote, may be desirable should there be system issues or outages, end quote. Minister, why did you give the job to a Darwin-based company that could not provide 24-7 support instead of following procurement rules and allowing Canberra companies to compete for the work? Ms Chain. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I thank the Leader of the Opposition for the question. Uh, I am aware uh, of the procurement decision that was undertaken. Uh, Ms Lee would have seen in those FOI documents uh, that this was at a, a delegation that was within the directorate. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the provider um, was, uh, on the face of it, value for money for us. I think it's important that everyone remember here that at the time that Choose CBR uh, was announced, uh, that we would be pursuing a digital discount system like this, that this had only been conducted once. Uh, I appreciate that there are several other schemes or similar schemes uh, that have taken place uh, in all manner of things since, uh, but at the time, just the Northern Territory had done this through the City of Darwin scheme, uh, and so this provider appeared to be uh, value for money uh, and also uh, had a system that had a template which we could essentially uh, borrow. Uh, but this was a, a decision that was made within the directorate. Supplementary, Ms Lee. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Minister, what's the point of having government procurement regulations if you do not follow them? Ms Chay. Madam Speaker, I, I dispute uh, the, uh, the nature of the question. I think, as Ms Lee pointed out uh, at her very first question, uh, that uh, this um, procurement, uh, the, the way it was undertaken, uh, was within the rules in terms of seeking an exemption. Ms Kessley. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Minister, what do you say to the local ICT companies who would have welcomed the opportunity to tender for the Choose CBR rollout and have provided the 24-7 support? Ms Chain. Ms Cassley is one of the biggest critics in this place of the administrative uh, support. In the question, rather than answering it, and that is against the standing orders. I, I, well, whether I think the question was long enough into the debate, but to answer the question, Ms Chain. Thank you, Madam Speaker. As I mentioned in my pre... Madam Speaker, as I mentioned in my previous answers, we were looking for value for money here. We were looking for something that could be done quickly, uh, noting the circumstances of the pandemic at the time. Uh, this was a product that had already um, been uh, 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 issued. It had worked in Darwin. Uh, we had reviewed it. We wanted to do something similar. Uh, so it made sense to procure something off the shelf. Questions without notice? Mrs Jones. Oh, thank you very much, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Business. Minister, FOI documents obtained by the Canberra Liberals revealed you were warned about risks with the ch full two CBR rollout, including a low take-up by business and ICT security and fraud. Warning, the warning noted, for the full rollout, there is the potential for greater financial gain, which increases the overall risk, potential fraud or questionable transactions. It warned that there were limited mechanisms to fully monitor transactions and provide a higher level of assurance around information provided by businesses. <coughs> Minister, given these warnings about the increased risk of fraud and limited ability to detect it, why didn't you change the scheme? Ms Chain. Thank you, Madam Speaker. There are risks uh, with every scheme, uh, and as the opposition will note, given they have apparently read uh, the documents, but I'm not sure in how much detail. Uh, when there are risks, we undertake a risk review. That's normal. Uh, and uh, with a scheme that has money uh, and, uh, and where we are 
distributing that money, uh, there is a potential risk of fraud. Uh, and that's exactly why we engaged with PwC to undertake uh, a risk review. And we did put in place measures, uh, including uh, the spot checking and the auditing uh, that we were doing internally. And as the opposition well knows, uh, by doing that, it, it did uncover uh, some questionable transactions, uh, including in one case where we suspended three related businesses. Mrs Jones. Thank you. Minister, given you were warned you could not give a high level of assurance to the community about the integrity of the scheme, why did you persist with it in the way you did? Ms Chang. Madam Speaker, I'm not sure what the opposition is trying to get at here in terms of uh, the, the fraud uh, that they think has occurred here. Uh, we have put risks were identified, risks were mitigated. Given the scheme was a $2 million scheme, I note that similar schemes in other jurisdictions are in the hundreds of millions of dollars uh, that also uh, have risks. Uh, I think uh, that uh, given we were wanting to uh, distribute money uh, and stimulate the economy uh, on the balance, uh, that uh, this was a low risk that is clear in the documents, and we proceeded accordingly. Dr Patterson. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, Minister, I was just wondering if you can further outline the risk review around the CBR rollout. Ms Chang. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. So um, the ACT government engaged PwC to complete a high-level risk review, uh, and that was prior to the trial in 2020. And the report did indicate that there were no known material issues or security breaches associated mm -hmm. with the platform that we procured. It did identify a number of risks with technical or process mitigations that could be considered. And indeed, one of those was about uh, potentially a malicious actor compromising merchant credentials and financial details. And so we addressed these risks through changes to system design and through additional procedures. And we do have no reason to believe that the system was compromised in this way. Uh, undertaking these sorts of uh, risk reviews uh, is standard government procedure, and uh, we were happy to undertake this uh, and respond accordingly. Questions without notice? Mr Hanson. Uh, Madam Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Business. Uh, FOI documents obtained by the Canberra Liberals reveal $230,000 of Canberra taxpayers' money was budgeted for communications, marketing and administration for the full CHU CBR rollout. This is despite you signing off in a ministerial brief on the 6th of May, which stated that the total proposed campaign is 154,000. The brief noted a more significant communications budget has enabled the use of a range of channels to reach more businesses and consumers. Minister, given less than 20% of eligible businesses benefited from the scheme, why are you so flippant with the Canberra taxpayers' money? Ms Chang. Thank you, Madam Speaker. It's well understood across industry uh, that uh, a communications campaign that is about 10% uh, of an overall spend uh, is pretty appropriate. And I know that the Canberra Liberals like to go on about only 20% of take-up. 20% of take-up was very large. We're able to support a huge number of businesses uh, through this. There was no flippancy here, and I absolutely dispute that. What we wanted was a strong take-up of the scheme. That's something that the opposition had criticised. This was a strong take-up of the scheme. We actively engaged with businesses. This was money well spent. But equally, I note that the money that was spent on this, uh, we did not need to, to use it all uh, that was budgeted uh, because the scheme uh, was expended quickly. Uh, it did um, essentially promote itself, uh, and so there were savings, uh, and there were savings uh, that were achieved ultimately. Mr. Hanson, you take responsibility for wasting hundreds of thousands of dollars of Canberrans' money to promote a failed scheme that 80% of eligible businesses do not register for. Ms. Chang. Uh, I don't agree with the premise of the question. 
supplementary. Minister, how is it that you could so easily increase the budget for communications by 76,000? Ms Chain, you have the call. Madam Speaker, I'll take that question on notice. I need to review the documents. Questions with that notice, Mr Davis? Madam Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Consumer Affairs. Minister, a few months ago I had the privilege of formally launching the Tuggeranong Repair Cafe organised by Sea Change, which I understand has grown to become the most popular repair cafe in Canberra. I think it speaks to how important Tuggeranites take our responsibility to recycle, reduce and reuse. Can you please tell me, uh, can you please, uh, tell me how, as Consumer Affairs Minister, you will advance the right to repair issues so that Canberrans can get products that are properly repairable, we can reduce e-waste and the environmental impact of consumer goods? Mr Rattenbury. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Yes, the Tokenon Repair Cafe is a real success. I met the organisers of it recently and they were very excited at the fact that they now have to take bookings because so many people want to come along. It speaks to a growing community enthusiasm for the ability to repair goods. The, the notion of a right to repair is one that's emerged out of Europe and the US in different ways. And it speaks to the idea that you should be able to take your good to get it repaired, to get the spare parts for it, to be able to do that at an affordable cost and without breaching your warranty. These are the sort of issues that have arisen in this space. Uh, the ACT government has particularly promoted this issue. Uh, we took a proposal to the Consumer Affairs Forum of Ministers from Australia and New Zealand a couple of years ago now, and from that has led to the Productivity Commission report, which is currently in progress. Uh, members may have seen the Productivity Commission has released their draft report. Uh, that was open for consultation until I think just last week, and they'll produce a final report later this year. This is really important in terms of empowering consumers uh, to be able to actually keep their products for as long as they want, to tinker with them, uh, to improve them, uh, and, but ultimately to, as Mr Davis has alluded to in his question, to minimise the amount of e-waste. Uh, Australia particularly is an incredibly large producer of e-waste, and being able to repair basic products like your phone, uh, and various other devices is both good for the consumer and good for the planet. Supplementary, Mr Davis. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Minister, what can the ACT government do to continue to lead the nation on the right to repair? Mr Rattenbury. Well, Madam Speaker, I think a couple of things. One is we are continuing to advocate for this issue. It is really important that it is given a national voice because as a jurisdiction alone, we cannot bring in national right to repair rules. I need to get the other consumer affairs ministers on board, probably the national treasurer, and through the support of the Productivity Commission's report, really make the case that in Australia there is a market failing here and we need governments to step in and actually put requirements onto producers to produce goods that can be repaired to supply the spare parts and the like. I was very interested to see in the Productivity Commission's draft report They've canvassed the idea of coming up with alternative dispute resolution mechanisms, including a binding conciliation power. Uh, members may, be, may recall that the ACT Assembly passed legislation to that effect uh, during the, towards the end of the last term, and that legislation is just about to come into effect where uh, Access Canberra will have the ability to compel a business uh, to come to the table with a consumer to resolve consumer matters under $5,000. So I was very pleased to see that South Australia have already done it, and now the ACT have already picked up some of the recommendations from the Productivity Commission. And I think this helps empower consumers uh, and give them that confidence uh, that they can, even if they have sort of repair, that this doesn't necessarily void the warranty. There are a lot of consumer myths out there, uh, and these sort of powers give consumers better prospects when it comes to making the case. Mr Braddock. Minister, what can our constituents do to support this work? Mr Ambry. Well, there's a real enthusiasm in the community, Madam Speaker, for people to get involved. I've been so impressed by the rise of repair cafes in the ACT. We've got, um, of course, the one at Togonong that Mr Davis asked about, the one at the Canberra Environment Centre, which is, I think, the original one here in Canberra. But in some ways, I think our men's sheds are the classic repair cafe where people are taking things, fixing them, putting them back together, um, zhushing them up, whatever. Uh, I don't know how Hansard's going to spell that, but <laughs> my apologies, Hansard. <laughs> uh, so I think there's that really practical element to it, uh, but there is a national movement, and I think for our constituents who are motivated by this, there are groups who are pushing this case. There is the opportunity to contribute to the 
uh, Productivity Commission's ongoing processes. And I think to make the case to various of our uh, parliamentary colleagues, particularly at the federal level, it is important that we receive, see reform in this space in Australia. Certainly in the European Union, they are increasingly adopting standards which require manufacturers to produce goods that don't have built-in obsolescence. They cannot be designed in a way that means you can't open them, you can't repair them. Uh, in the US, it's a, been a slightly different focus where it's been much more about farm machinery and the like, but also on auto vehicles. Uh, and so I think this is a very much a consumer-led campaign. And for those who are motivated by it, you know, there's a lot of research online and it's well worth getting involved in some of those campaigns. Questions without notice, Mr. Patterson. Speaker, my question is for the Chief Minister. Chief Minister, can you please update the Assembly on the latest economic data for the Territory? Mr. Buck. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I thank Mr. Patterson for the question. Uh, uh, yes, I can. Uh, gross state product for the Territory grew by 2.4 per cent, and the most recent data in a period where the Australian economy, in fact, went backwards by 0.3 of a per cent. Our state final demand uh, grew by 2.1 per cent over the year to March 21. Uh, that's slightly above uh, Australia's GDP growth in that period of 1.8 per cent. Uh, retail trade turnover is up 7.3 per cent over the year to June 21, uh, and retail spending is around 17.5 per cent above decade uh, average levels in the March quarter. Housing finance sees the number of owner occupier commitments up 47.5 per cent over the year to June 21. The number of first home buyer commitments is up 41 per cent, and the number of investment commitments uh, was up nearly 110 per cent, Madam Speaker, uh, in the most recent data. Building approvals, the total number of residential dwellings approved increased by 31.3 per cent in June 2021. I note the Property Council have put out their office market report, uh, and the Property Council advised that the latest report for the ACT reveals strong market demand with the highest net demand of any commercial leasing sector in the country and the lowest vacancy rate uh, the Territory has seen since 2009, Madam Speaker. Now, of course, a strong public health response is essential to maintaining this economic activity and protecting and creating jobs. That's why the government is committed to delivering the vaccination rollout as effectively as possible, uh, subject, of course, to supply of vaccines from the federal government. We know that vaccines are the only way out of this pandemic. And Madam Speaker, yesterday we opened vaccination bookings to Canberrans in their 30s, uh, and nearly 21,000 bookings were made in a single day. That's four times the previous record, Madam Speaker. Your time has expired. Supplementary, Mr Pedersen. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Chief Minister, will the ACT government seek to partner with the Commonwealth Government to strengthen our economic recovery? Mr Barr. Uh, in short, yes, we will. Uh, we've been able to partner with the Commonwealth on a range of important infrastructure projects, such as light rail stage 2A, uh, the duplications of Gundaroo, Gundaroo Drive and William Hovell Drive, the upgrades to the Monero Highway and Tuggeranong Parkway, and the Malonglo River Bridge crossing. Looking beyond these projects, Madam Speaker, we look forward to working with the Commonwealth to see a consolidation and revitalisation of the Australian Institute of Sport at Bruce, a boost to housing supply for the Territory at the former CSIRO Ginandera site, the rejuvenation of Commonwealth Park, the Commonwealth Avenue Bridge Renewal Project and the next stage of the Acton Waterfront development. Dr Patterson. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Chief Minister, have you raised any specific new proposals with the Commonwealth? Mr Barr. Yes, I have, Madam Speaker, and I thank Dr Patterson for the question. Uh, I've written to the Federal Treasurer uh, and the Minister for Tourism uh, requesting a nationally consistent approach to support tourism, hospitality, businesses and workers that have been affected by lockdowns outside of their state or territory. I've asked the Commonwealth to consider further extending the COVID-19 disaster payment to eligible employees in the tourism and hospitality sectors including those in the ACT who have lost income as a result of outbreaks in other jurisdictions. We've been able to secure this support uh, for workers in this context where they were exposed interstate but undertook their isolation in the ACT. We've got them eligible for these payments, but we want to see this extended. The government will also continue to monitor impacts 
uh, locally on our economy as a result of the interstate lockdowns and we will consider additional support if required. Questions without notice. Mr Parton. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Chief Minister. Chief Minister, last Friday morning on Chief Minister's talkback on local ABC radio, you said that thousands of warnings had been issued to motorists exceeding the 40 kilometre per hour speed limit in the new speed restriction areas in Civic. Chief Minister, have thousands of individual warning notices been issued to motorists exceeding the new speed limit prior to July 5? Mr Barr. Mr Chair. I guess I don't have direct responsibility for that. No, so I understand, yeah. but it's yeah. just, it's based on your... Yeah. Well, I think, Ms Chain, I mean, the ministers can, um, responsible, yeah. answer the question. Ms Chain. Yes, thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. I'm sorry, Mr Pardon, could you please repeat the question? Sorry. So, so it was in its entirety to the, to the Chief Minister. I said last Friday morning mm -hmm. on Chief Minister Talkback, you said that thousands of warnings had been issued to motorists exceeding the 40 kilometre speed limit in the new speed restriction areas in Civic. Have thousands of individual warning notices been issued to motorists exceeding the new speed limit prior to July 5? Ms Chen? Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. The short answer to that uh, is no. Uh, from 5 July uh, until 26 July, that's the latest data that I have, uh, 18,437 infringement notices have been issued. Uh, however, um, between uh, in the two weeks, in the two week grace period, uh, there was a considerable communications uh, campaign. Uh, and that followed, uh, Madam Speaker, and I'll go into the detail of that communications campaign, uh, that followed uh, nine uh, uh, items that had covered it uh, before the grace, covered the, um, the new 40 kilometre hour zone before the grace period, 11 um, uh, media items that uh, covered the grace period, and since then there have been at least seven um, media items. Um, variable messaging signs have been used in the area uh, between May, June and July. Uh, we've also uh, uh, had radio ads across multiple time slots on either side of the news during uh, peak hour to alert motorists uh, to this change. I do note that the change uh, came into place uh, in March. Uh, we did not start enforcing until July. There was a very long lead period. We had the grace period to alert as many Canberrans as possible. Uh, we had a social media post on our own ACT government channels, and I note that they've been on other channels, uh, including Canberra Notice Board Group, including on Reddit, uh, where there have been 1,400 comments uh, just on an ACT government social media account alone. Uh, but, Madam Speaker, to send uh, individual warning letters your time has expired and you have a supplementary and Mr Hanson, I'll ask you to be quiet. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, to whoever wants to answer it, um, why did the Chief Minister tell the public that thousands of warnings had been issued if that was in fact not the case? Mr. Uh, thank Barr. you, Rob. Uh, my understanding was that there had been communication, extensive communication from the time uh, the speed zones changed in March to when infringement notices were issued. If I made an error, I apologise for that. Obviously, in the context of Chief Minister Talkback, uh, there are potentially thousands of issues that can be raised. Uh, I, I don't... Mr. I don't Mr. have... Um, yeah, I don't have, obviously, instant recollection of every single thing. I do recall a discussion in relation uh, to this matter. I got it wrong. I apologise. Nevertheless, the, the point stands that there have been months and months of discussion, warnings, speed signs, debate on this issue. Uh, and the fact that the speed has changed in that area has been very well canvassed uh, throughout the community uh, for a period of, uh, what, a third of a year now. Ms Lewis. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, Chief Minister or the Minister, 
why won't you waive the low range speeding fines being incurred by thousands of Canberrans given that there were no warnings given and given clearly how ineffective the safety and the speed advisory measures appear to be? Ms Chan. Madam Speaker, that's a pretty extraordinary question, I have to say. There are 17 signs uh, around the three cameras, 17. Uh, and for Ms Lee uh, to take that approach, this is about road safety. Uh, this is about an area that has high pedestrian activity. That's exactly why we reduced uh, the, the speeds. Uh, this is an area that I think uh, the, the member for Currajong should be interested in enlivening. Uh, and and to, you know, when that we have had months and months of communications about this, when we have offered a grace period, when we have communicated regularly during the grace period about uh, the number of people who were speeding, that this had an extraordinary amount of media take up, something that the Liberals can only dream of, I suspect. Uh, and, and to then take that approach, it is not usual practice to Members. issue warning letters for drivers with 20,000 with 20, with 20, people speeding through that time. Members. Members. Madam Speaker, with 20,000 vehicles detected committing an offence, Sending a warning letter to every single driver would have been a manual process, which would have been a significant diversion of resources. Sending a warning letter, we would have immediately had you criticising it. So you can't have it both ways, Mr Hanson. Members, questions without notice. Mr Milligan. Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Business. FOI documents about two CBR obtained by the Canberra Liberals reveal all reasonable load tests were carried out on the site when the vouchers were deployed. However, an internal Treasury Directorate ministerial brief dated on May the 3rd states the schedules allows a short window for user testing of the voucher redemption process. The brief also reveals the short time frame between decision and program launch means development and user acceptance testing timetables are compressed. Minister, do you take responsibility for failing to properly test the system which saw it crash just after one day? Ms Chain. Madam Speaker, there was a lot of testing uh, done on the system, but there was also an extraordinary take up of the system far beyond uh, anything that we had seen in the trial um, by a, a factor or a rate of knots that we just had not seen uh, in the trial. There had been significant uh, testing. There also was uh, quite a lot of communication uh, with um, the developer, uh, including um, past tests and, and making sure uh, that uh, it was uh, at a standard that we were ready to hit go on. Uh, given the amount of uh, interest uh, and communication about this and that we had, you know, I had personally gone to businesses about this, I was confident uh, about uh, the launch of it. Uh, and I have said repeatedly that I am sorry uh, that it uh, was not able to hold up to the, the sheer volume that we had uh, on those first few days, um, but we did do that further work that did uh, increase uh, the, the, the amount of loads that we were able to, to have on the website. And that's exactly what uh, resulted in the, the, the relaunch of it a week later, where we saw a considerable, uh, an, an even higher amount of transactions uh, where there were no issues reported, uh, something that the opposition conveniently forgets. Mr Milligan, supplementary. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Minister, why did you rush the CBR scheme and compromise testing and making the program such a shamble? Ms. It wasn't Chan. rushed, Madam Speaker. Mrs Cookett. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, Minister, why didn't you allow more time for testing, given you were warned the short window of time meant testing would be compressed? Ms Chan. Madam Speaker, all reasonable tests were conducted in that time. Questions without notice? Ms Clay. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister for the Environment. 
Minister, I recently went for a walk near Lawson Grasslands and learned about the critically endangered grasslands, box gum woodlands, and threatened species on the site, like golden sun moth, the striped legless lizard, and the Purunga grasshopper. Lawson Grasslands are on, the national, are on national land, and they are marked for future development by Defence Housing Australia. What consultations has the Environment, Planning and Sustainable Development Directorate conducted about this proposed development with the National Capital Authority, Defence Housing Australia, the Department of Defence and their contractors? Ms. Pesarotti. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you, Ms. Clay, for the question. Um, as as uh, Ms. Clay you noted, this is actually national capital land, so the ACT government is not the decision maker um, on this um, on on this site. And we do know that um, Defence Housing Australia, who is it, the administrators for the site, are proposing to put. A, um, a housing development on that site. Um, as you also note, this is a, is a really important site in relation to the conservation, conservation values that it has, particularly around native temperate grasslands that is you know, very, um, very precious. And certainly in ACT, on ACT government land, we have protected a number of, um, of sites that have similar ecological values. In relation to consultation that has happened to, um, happened to date, ACT government conservation officers have actually undertaken a site visit on the 30th of June 2020 to discuss the proposed um, development in Lawson with Defence Housing Australia. Um, with future development that will occur, um, it will be subject to environmental approval, um, particularly under the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act. And with the planning, with the plan and planning approval by the National Capital Act, so ACT government will be um, will be um, able to provide consultation, um, but but will not be the decision maker in that instance. Ms. Clay, supplementary. Do you think Lawson grasslands should be protected? Certainly, the ecological values that have been identified on the site, um, particularly in terms of ecological community. Um, of the temperate grasslands and the woodland um, threatened, um, threatened communities as well that have been confirmed on the site. It certainly meets, me, meets criteria that if this site was on ACT government land, I think we would absolutely look at protecting the site. Um, we do know that it does have um, elements on the site that means that it does need to be looked at in terms of the Environment Protection and Biodiversity and Conservation Act. Sadly, because it is national land, um, there isn't um, an opportunity um, to have um, any approval, but it certainly um, contains elements that we would consider would be important to protect. Mr Braddock. Thank you, Minister. Is EPSDD actively working on any feedback on this development at the moment? And if so, what are they working on? Ms Pazzarotti. Yes. Thank you. Um, thank you for the, for the question. Um, so, um, as noted, um, because it will go through an approval process through the EPBC Act, um, we, ex we, we know that um, the, the, the relevant government department, the Commonwealth Department of Agriculture, Water and Environment, will be um, contacting EPSDD for comment. Um, we don't have access to using a bilater bilateral agreement because it is on national land, um, but we certainly have been engaging in terms of understanding what's on the site and we'll be very active in that approval process in terms of providing information. <laughs> Questions without notice, Dr. Patterson. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Women. Minister, what is the ACT government doing to prevent and respond to sexual harassment in our workplaces and across the country? Ms. Kimini. Madam Speaker, and I thank Dr. Patterson for her question. Of course, the ACT government is making great progress against its commitments to prevent and respond to sexual harassment across the ACT community. Uh, members will recall that in June I announced the chair of the overarching steering committee for sexual assault prevention and response program, Renee Leon, who is an experienced CEO with over 15 years in senior roles, including as departmental secretary in the Australian Public Service. In her role as the chair, Ms Leon will work with the steering committee representatives and the working groups and reference groups in this program to drive prevention responses to sexual harassment and assault in the ACT and advise on key priorities for action by the government. 
Led by the sector, this work will be inclusive and intersectional about experiences from across the community, including from people with disability, children and young people, the LGBTIQ plus community, the <coughs> Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community, and communities that are culturally and linguistically diverse. A reference group has been set up focusing specifically on sexual harassment and assault in the workplace, and this group will provide input to all the working groups to represent the perspectives of workers and workplace safety. Uh, within the working groups and reference groups, a steering committee chair will now be moving forward uh, as those uh, meetings have occurred within all those working groups. And I know members in this place, um, the Leader of the Opposition, Ms Lee and Dr Patterson, have already presented to those uh, to their law reform working groups, and I know that there are more presentations to come along. As well, the ACT government has set up in the, our own workplace here in the Legislative Assembly the Parliamentary Women's Group, the Government Women's Caucus, as well as a support network for staff. So I'm confident, Madam Speaker, that the ACT government is well positioned to deliver an evidence-based approach to sexual assault that places victim survivors at the front. Dr Patterson, supplementary. Thank you. Um, Minister, how is sexual harassment a gendered issue? Ms Berry. Thanks, Madam Speaker. I thank Dr Patterson for the supplementary. Um, this week, um, I, uh, yesterday, in fact, I tabled the ACT government's response to the Australian Human Rights Commission's Respect at Work National Inquiry into Sexual Harassment in Australian Workplaces. The ACT government's response provides a position on each of the 55 recommendations in the Respect at Work report. The ACT government acknowledges that gendered power imbalances in the workplace and across society are key drivers of sexual harassment and that other forms of discrimination, disadvantage and harassment intersect to compound the impact of sexual harassment, such as sexuality, cultural background and disability. These gendered power imbalances go to the root of mainstream and harmful understandings of gender, the way we misunderstand gender as a binary with set roles and ways of behaving. I can say anecdotally that psychosocial hazards, such as sexual harassment, are more prevalent in traditionally female industries such as nursing, education and hospitality. And these hazards lead to risks which can result in long-lasting psychological injuries. These types of injuries present a workplace safety issue, yet they can be more hidden and can develop over time. They can also go untreated and unacknowledged, and this presents another workplace gender act, the uh, gender gap. The ACT government is committed to continuing primary prevention work, uh, doing that work across our ACT public schools, as well as importantly across the community to challenge harmful gender norms and prevent and respond to sexual harassment. Ms. Hall. Mr. Speaker, Minister, what would the ACT propose should be implemented across the country to address gendered violence? Ms. Berry. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I thank Ms Orr for the supplementary question. Well, everyone has the right to feel safe, safe in the community, safe at home and safe at work. And the Australian Human Rights Commission's Respect at Work report demonstrates that far too many people, for far too many people this is not the case. 39% of women, 26% of men have all experienced sexual uh, harassment at work in the last five years. This reality stems from gender inequality and unequal power structures where employers fall short by not holding perpetrators and harassers to account. Workplace sexual harassment warrants a national response, and the ACT government encourages action by the Commonwealth to protect workers and to take steps to advance women's safety and gender equality. The Sex Discrimination and Fair Work Respect at Work Amendment Bill 2021 responds to some, but not all, of the recommendations from the Respect at Work report. And the ACT government is encouraging the Commonwealth to reconsider its position with regard to delaying broader amendments to the fair work system. To delay the introduction of counterpart amendments to, the explicit, to explicitly prohibit sexual harassment under the Fair Work Act limits our ability to clearly demonstrate our rejection of discrimination in any form. As a government committed to upholding the rights and entitlements and protections of workers, I want to acknowledge the work of Minister Gentleman in this space. It's our position that the Commonwealth should be taking advantage of the opportunities provided by the Bill to ensure that sexual harassment and discrimination 
on the grounds of sex are expressly <coughs> prohibited under the Fair Work Act. To, the, to do this, we would need to provide the strongest evidence possible to the federal government to ensure that they can do this work. Questions without notice, Mrs. Cooper. Supplementary. Oh, yes, new question. Thank you, um, Madam Speaker. Chief Minister, when you incorrectly told the Canberra public that thousands of warnings had been issued to motorists exceeding the 40 km per hour speed limit in the new speed restrictions area in Civic, did anyone from your office or directorate advise you of this error? Mr. Barr. And there was actually no question to me there, but I'll take it that the question was, it wasn't asked, but nevertheless, uh, no, Madam Speaker. Mrs. Cooker. Chief Minister, why did your office or director fail to alert you to this error and why does it take questioning from the opposition to bring the truth to light? Mr. Barr. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I don't know that this would be the top issue that we've been dealing with at the moment, frankly, uh, in the middle of a pandemic with massive implications, a lot of other issues uh, on my desk at the moment. I apologise. You tell him the truth. Mr Hanson, enough. I apologise for the error. There was a, a lot of warnings given, but it would appear not individual warnings to individual motorists by way of letter. I apologise if there is any misunderstanding in relation to that matter. What is, but what is very clear, Madam Speaker, is there were months and months of warnings, signs, media coverage, social media commentary, debate in the community about the initiative and in its uh, substance. Uh, I apologise. Right at the moment, I had a lot of things on my plate, not least of which is leading this territory's response to a global pandemic. So I apologise for getting it wrong on this issue. But right now, of all the things that we face, this is not in the top 10, Madam Speaker. Well, if your colleagues were quiet, I'd give you sure, a call. Sure, everybody. Ms Lee. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, Minister, or Chief Minister, or the Relevant Minister, how much was spent on all the new and variable signage, the public information campaign, and how does this compare to the cost of sending out warning letters? Mr. Barr. I'll take that on notice. Questions without notice. Ms. Castley. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Chief Minister. On June the 22nd, you gave a ministerial statement, and I quote, our actions have meant the ACT continues to be one of Australia's strongest economies with the strongest labour market in the country. Unemployment was 3.6%, which you said was significantly below the Territory's decade average, and I quote, the lowest in the country by a long way. Just one month later, on July the 26th, the Canberra Times ran a story with the headlines that ACT job market is the weakest in the nation, with the quarterly ComSec report revealing unemployment had climbed to 4.9%. ACT Treasury said that 5,900 Canberrans had lost their jobs. Chief Minister and Treasurer. Why have 5,900 Canberrans lost their jobs in the last month under your watch? Mr Barr. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. The monthly unemployment data is subject to considerable uh, variation. It's a very small sample size and it is often uh, backcast and adjusted. Uh, a movement of that size is unprecedented. Mm -hmm. uh, we looked uh, at other sources of data, including the uh, single-touch payroll data, that indicates that there was a decline in employment, but not to the extent registered in that single month's figure. So uh, we are looking, uh, obviously, at uh, the situation. Uh, the unemployment rate in the ACT, according to that month, one single month snapshot, is the same as the Australian unemployment rate. So, whilst the CBA commentary would in fact reflect uh, the fact that normally uh, unemployment in the ACT is lower than the national average, there's this one rogue figure. We'll need more data to confirm if that is actually the case, and I suspect there may be a downward revision, but I don't know yet. And so when we get the next set of unemployment data, which is due in a couple of weeks, We'll have a better sense of whether this is a one-off anomaly or, in fact, a developing trend. Uh, if it is a developing trend, then the government will seek to respond by creating more jobs, including in our budget, in August. 
Supplementary. So how will these 5,900 unemployed Canberrans be able to find work given the unemployment rate is well above the decade average? Mr Barr. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. Well, several weeks ago, before the Sydney lockdown commenced, the biggest single complaint from most industry sectors in the ACT was an inability to find workers. Uh, this remains the case for nearly all industry sectors within the ACT economy, except for those that are tourism exposed, because clearly with the lockdown in Sydney, the Victorian lockdown and the Queensland lockdown, our tourism industry has lost about 85% of its market. So it doesn't, it's not experiencing a supply side shock. All of the businesses are able to trade with no restrictions. It's experiencing a demand side shock as a result uh, of pandemic induced uh, lockdowns in the three biggest Australian states. So the issue from here, Madam Speaker, will be uh, whether our local economy, given Canberrans can't really travel many places, we will see a, a local spend pick up. And the June retail trade figures are encouraging in that regard. And for hospitality, for example, in June, it was the third highest spend ever in the history of that data set, coming from May, which was the highest ever spend in the history of that data set. Uh, so it is showing that Canberrans will spend their money locally when they can't travel overseas or interstate. Dr Patterson. Speaker. Um, Chief Minister, in addressing the unemployment rate, what is the ACT government doing to create more jobs? Mr Barr. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Well, obviously, we are the second largest employer in the city ourselves, uh, and so we have taken on the responsibility of promoting employment growth and secure local jobs uh, through a range of initiatives uh, that the government undertakes, as well as support uh, of key uh, industry sectors uh, that are large employers. Uh, so we will continue that focus uh, as we project beyond the immediate lockdowns uh, uh, along the eastern seaboard of Australia. Uh, we would anticipate the sort of economic rebound that we saw after a similar wave of lockdowns in 2020. Uh, the evidence appears to be that short, sharp lockdowns uh, have the least economic cost and then we will see a rebound. Now, we hope the short, sharp lockdowns that have worked in Victoria will work in Queensland. Uh, it is now obviously too late for a short, sharp lockdown in New South Wales and so they are in for several more months, it would seem, uh, of lockdown and restrictions. We are factoring that in. Uh, to our economic thinking given Sydney uh, and the Greater Sydney region represents about 20% of the national economy. Questions without notice, Mr Braddock. Thank you, Madam Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Health. The repeated lesson from COVID is the need to communicate effectively with all parts of the community, in particular those for whom English is not their first language. In what languages has ACT Health produced materials to provide information about COVID? Ms Stephen Smith. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker, and I thank Mr Braddock for the question. I'll take the detail of the question on notice. I can advise Mr Braddock that the COVID-19 website has available uh, materials available in 15 languages, but I don't have the list of those languages um, on me. It's probably actually available on the COVID-19 website, which, of the, which those languages actually are. Um, the Public Information Coordination Centre for COVID-19, which has been running for some time now, takes very seriously uh, the importance of uh, communicating with culturally and linguistically diverse communities in the ACT. And in fact, a liaison officer from the Community Services Directorate works with the PIC to help identify opportunities to communicate with cold communities. And I know that's really been appreciated over time. COVID-19 media statements are all that detail, uh, detailing key changes in travel and restrictions are also provided in audio format to two Canberra community radio stations and these stations collectively broadcast in more than 20 languages um, spoken in the ACT. Public health advice is also provided through proactive interviews and community radio in response to particular issues and circumstances, for example, for example the celebration of Eid while remaining COVID safe and tips on how to, apply, how to comply with public health directions like completing uh, declaration forms. 
The COVID-19 media statement is also provided to the Riot Act Chinese edition team to disseminate information to approximately 8,000 Canberrans who read Chinese. And from this month, Facebook campaign advertising will include a language translation option, which allows both the user and moderator to see the content in a number of languages. Uh, officials are also looking at how this can be applied to broader communication activities. Mr. What is the vaccination rate for culturally and linguistically diverse communities in the ACT? Ms. Stephen Smith. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'll take the detail of that question on notice. I am not sure that we're going to be able to provide a specific figure um, for Mr. Braddock in relation to that. I just don't know that our data will capture all, uh, the, all, all the culturally and linguistically diverse communities in the ACT. Um, but if there's specific information that Mr Braddock um, is after, he, he can always ask our office and we'll do our best to try to get um, that specific information to him. Um, but we do know in terms of vaccination, again, as per the broader public communications around COVID-19, that engagement with culturally and linguistically diverse communities has been a key priority. Um, and we're seeing that right across the community. Indeed, it's recognised as one of the challenges in uh, the vaccination of the aged care workforce, for which, of course, the Commonwealth has primary responsibility, uh, that overcoming vaccine hesitancy and ensuring that people um, in those frontline workforces are able to come forward and confident to come forward and get vaccinated is about addressing insecure work and the consequences of potentially having um, an, an adverse reaction to a vaccine, a short-lived reaction um, that will mean needing to take a day off work and people being um, remunerated for that, but also ensuring that people um, can hear uh, from people that they trust, their community leaders and people who speak their language about that. And that's something we've been working very closely with the Commonwealth and their providers um, to ensure is happening uh, in that um, aged care workforce. More broadly, paid community uh, radio ads have been running in 10 languages and social media ads have been targeting both Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander and culturally and, and linguistically diverse communities. Radio scripts are provided to the Canberra Multicultural Community Forum to read out in different languages through their community radio shows uh, and resources are available on the COVID-19 website, as I said, in multiple languages. Uh, and we really work closely with community leaders as well. Ms Clay, supplementary. Thank you, Madam Speaker. What's the vaccination rate for First Nations peoples in the OCD? Ms Stephen Smith. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, and again, that, that data is actually available in our weekly um, vaccination update, but I don't have that with me at the moment. So I'll take the question on notice um, and come back to the chamber, but I'll be able to provide that information uh, potentially um, directly after this. Um, it is the vaccination rate is lower for the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community than it is for the rest of the community, and uh, we've been working uh, with that community. Obviously, Wenunga Nimitzja is um, a vaccination centre, and they can provide uh, both AstraZeneca and now Pfizer vaccines as well, and have been doing a great job in reaching out to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community um, to get vaccinated. I can say the vaccination rate in the older age group for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people is high. So those over 65, it is actually uh, very high. Uh, but for those in younger age groups and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are eligible down to the age of 16 and from next Monday will be eligible down to the age of 12, uh, the vaccination rate is not as high uh, as it is for the wider community. So obviously um, we will continue to work uh, with Winunga, we will continue to hold community engagement sessions and I can advise that ACT Health has um, had face-to-face -face sessions uh, throughout the COVID-19 response, so not necessarily specifically in relation to vaccination, with the Ask Act Across Galunga program, with Guggen Gulwan, uh, and with Yedong Mura Good Pathways, um, as, well as, and, uh, as well as working very closely with Winunga to try and increase vaccine take-up in that community. Questions without notice, Mr Kane. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Business. In June, the Canberra Business Chamber revealed Canberra has the lowest long-term business survival rate in the country, with only 62.5% of ACT businesses trading after five years, compared to more than 65% nationally. Minister, this surely challenges the government's goal of reaching 250,000 jobs in Canberra by 2025. Minister, why are more businesses failing in the ACT compared with the rest of the country? 
Mr. Barr. I'll, I'll take this one. Uh, the government uh, is aware uh, that that is uh, there is a minor statistical difference between the national average and the ACT average. Uh, that is uh, less than three percentage points, given the uh, the total number of businesses uh, we're talking about. It uh, really uh, comes down to dozens uh, in in actual reality in terms of the, the number of businesses. I do note uh, Mr Kane uh, excluded from his question and in fact we also have the fastest number of or we have the most number of new businesses. Now every, uh, every month uh, we get an update on business entries and exits in the ACT and I can advise the Assembly that in every single month there are more business entries than there are business exits. So the number of businesses in the Territory continues to grow month on month. Uh, questions are in relation to uh, the detail of why certain businesses survive and others don't uh, is the subject uh, of some uh, discussion and debate uh, and there is some national research I understand in, into this matter. Uh, a little bit will depend of course uh, on the nature of the business as to whether it's a sole trader for example. Uh, there's, there is a, a degree of, uh, a higher degree of uh, sole trader and micro businesses in the ACT where people register an ABN uh, to undertake some additional uh, income earning activity that's secondary to their main job. Uh, that is one factor uh, that is uh, clearly the case in terms of both entries and exits in the ACT that appears to be somewhat different. Uh, from other parts of Australia. Uh, but the statistical difference between the ACT and the national average is not so great as to suggest uh, that there is a massive gulf uh, between what happens here uh, and what happens elsewhere in Australia. Mr Kane, supplementary. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Minister, how many of the new jobs required for us to reach the target of 250,000 will be created directly or indirectly by Commonwealth government spending? Mr Barr. Uh, thank you. Well, the Commonwealth accounts for one in four jobs in our economy at the moment uh, in terms of direct employment. If you then extrapolate uh, Commonwealth funding, for example, to public institutions like the universities, uh, then that would see uh, the level of Commonwealth-generated uh, job activity uh, increase uh, closer uh, towards perhaps one half uh, of all employment. Uh, that would be higher in the ACT, clearly, than, uh, than any other economy uh, in Australia. But uh, I guess it depends, Mr Kane, on how far you extend the reach uh, of you know, Commonwealth uh, created, uh, because, because yeah, well, they, they Put money in. I mean, the government uh, and governments uh, at federal and state and territory level are obviously significant employers in and of themselves, uh, and the amount of money that is churned through the economy uh, by governments to support other industries. I mean, for example, just in recent days, the Commonwealth uh, has put you know, hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars further into the aviation industry, for example, to uh, to protect employment. Now, we could have a philosophical debate about. Uh, whether jobs in the aviation industry are Commonwealth supported or not. Uh, you know, to some extent they are, and they certainly have been extensively uh, during the pandemic. Questions supplementary, Ms Kessley? Financial support to help businesses survive. Mr Barr. Well, our government is providing direct financial support uh, to help businesses survive in a, in a number of different ways, uh, Madam Speaker, across a number of different industry sectors, uh, uh, from uh, grants to support uh, business activity uh, in the export field, uh, from grants to support business uh, activity uh, in the domestic market, tourism uh, and otherwise, Madam Speaker. Uh, we continue to support a variety of different industry sectors. Uh, Almost every part of the ACT economy has a degree of public subsidy one way or the other. I mean, this, this city would not exist without government. This economy is artificial to the extent that it would not have generated $41 billion of activity if there wasn't government intervention, government support and a deliberate decision more than a century ago uh, to have an administrative capital uh, that was wholly contained within New South Wales uh, but a certain distance from Sydney. Uh, Canberra would not, uh, you know, this economy would not exist without those decisions. So uh, almost everything that happens in Canberra uh, clearly has a degree of government influence, be that federal 
uh, or territory. Although over time, as the population has increased uh, and the economy has diversified, there is more activity uh, that might be sustainable outside uh, of the public sector ecosystem that is uh, the basis and uh, the reason for being for the City of Canberra. Questions without notice? Ms Hall. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Planning and Land Management. Minister, what is the significance of World Ranger Day? Mr Gentleman. Ms Orr, for her question and, of course, her interest in the management of ACT parks and reserves, last Saturday was the 31st of July, was World Ranger Day. Uh, as the name suggests, this occasion is celebrated around the world. It provides a chance to reflect and thank those whose job it is to care for the environment that we live in. It's also time for acknowledging rangers around the world who sometimes face life-threatening situations and to commemorate those who have died in the line of duty. It is a day to recognise those who stand up to protect wildlife and ecosystems, sometimes on the front line of conservation. This may include active protection from poachers and illegal logging. Although it seems like an amazing job, and it can be, Madam Speaker, it can also be dangerous. Here in the ACT, our rangers deal with dangers including venomous snakes, rescuing lost hikers and battling bushfires. World Ranger Day is a time to pause and reflect on those working around the world who are killed or injured at work, but it's also a time to celebrate the wonderful work of our rangers and dedicated staff who love their jobs and love our bush capital. Ms Hall, supplementary. Thank you. Uh, Minister, how are parks and conservation staff protecting our bush capital? Mr Gentleman. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. As you and I know from our many years in this place, our rangers in the ACT are extremely dedicated to their jobs. They've worked especially hard over the past year to give Canberrans more opportunities to enjoy our parks and reserves. During COVID restrictions, the ACT's parks and reserves have been more valuable to ever uh, for Canberrans. Our rangers have worked tirelessly to maintain and improve them, including carrying out substantial repairs from bushfire damage. These efforts meant Namaji National Park was able to reopen to visitors earlier than expected. And they've worked hard to prepare for the upcoming bushfire season to help Your protect our parks has expired. and the native. Yeah, I, yeah, it didn't seem to go then. Um, members, are we, given that there was clearly a problem with the clock, can we give a few more seconds to the Minister? Thank you. Yes, we, they have worked very hard uh, to protect our native wildlife, including within a Mulligan's Flat and Tidbin Villa Sanctuaries uh, and at the new grassland Eelis Dragon Breeding Facility. They've also done great work, Madam Speaker, in planning for the future of our bush capital by developing management plans, carrying out strategic operations and taking great care in conservation practices. So I want to thank everyone in the ACT Parks and Conservation Service for that important work. Mr Pedersen. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Minister, what other ways is the ACT government caring for our parks and reserves? Mr Gentleman. And I thank Mr Pedersen for his question too. The government has supported volunteer groups for a number of years and I'm proud to have been involved in delivering funding and support for these groups. They do excellent work across the many parks and reserves in the ACT as land managers and custodians. Volunteers have been involved along with parks and conservation staff in bushfire recovery in Namaji National Park. Uh, they also work on weed management, seasonal restoration as well as planting and cleanups. Their support for the work of Parks and Conservation Service, of course, is invaluable. And I'm extremely pleased that the groups will have continued funding from the ACT government for the next four years. This support from the government is a reflection of the hard work and dedication of those volunteers. And our volunteers work uh, closely with our rangers to care for the unique environment in the ACT. They share a passion and a dedication to conservation in our bush capital and the love of the outdoors. Canberrans love our bush capital, Madam Speaker, and I encourage all of those who are interested in conservation to get involved in our local land management groups. Mr Barr. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Further questions can be placed on the notice page. Thank you, Mr Barr. Matters arising from question time, Mr Barr. Thank you, Mr Barr. asked me a question uh, in relation to uh, comments on Chief Minister Talkback. I, uh, the one point I neglected to, uh, 
to raise in my response uh, to him was that I understand that uh, obviously there was a grace period between when the cameras uh, were active and then when enforcement commenced. The speed limit changed in March, I understand, uh, and enforcement didn't begin until July. Uh, and there was a period in between, clearly, where, um, uh, where there were, were no fines issued. I have, I have confused that. Uh, and thought that warnings were issued rather than no fines. I again apologise uh, for that confusion. Other matters arising from question time, Ms Chain? Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I was asked about the uh, discrepancy in the communications uh, spend for Choose CBR. Uh, the opposition is uh, conflating two different briefs, um, so essentially not comparing apples with apples. Uh, $230,000 was the total allocation uh, for marketing, communications and administration costs. Uh, the $150,000 figure that they used uh, includes GST. Um, $140,000 was the campaign allocation. Uh, so um, what they're drawing uh, that figure from is the brief about the campaign uh, allocation uh, and me approving it. Uh, going to the independent reviewer, which is standard practice for campaigns, uh, over $40,000. Other matters arising, Ms Stephen Smith. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, Mr Braddock asked which languages translated resources were available in. Uh, the COVID-19 ACT government resources are available on the web page. Uh, I think I said in 15 languages that includes English, so the other 14 languages are Arabic, Chinese, simplified, Chinese, traditional, Dari, Farsi, Filipino, Greek, Hindi, Korean, Spanish, Tamil, Thai, Urdu, and Vietnamese. And those information, uh, that information can be found at www.covid19.act.gov.au slash community slash translated hyphen resources. Uh, and also on that page, um, there are links to AC Australian government resources uh, that have been translated, and there are also links to SBS resources, and their multi multilingual portal um, has information available in 63 languages. Uh, Ms Clay also asked about vaccination rates uh, for the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community. Uh, I can advise the Assembly that as at the 28th of July, which is the latest figures that I have available to me, 94% uh, of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Canberrans aged 60 and above had had a first dose and 48% a second dose, so comparing that to the broader ACT residents, that compares to 85% and 35%. So as I said, for older Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, um, the rates are high. For Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people aged 16 to 59, 28% uh, have had a first dose and 15% are fully vaccinated. That compares with a wider community, the all ACT residents numbers of 36% and 18%, so uh, slightly lower. That may reflect the fact that um, Wanunga didn't get access to the Pfizer um, vaccinations early in the program, they do now have access to Pfizer, and so um, I, I think we can expect to see that they will be promoting that access to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people under the age of 60 years. Other matters arising? We'll move to...